I feel very called to become a member of the Catholic Church. Love the Catholic Church. It's just the best place to be. From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line. In North America, call toll-free 1-800-585-9396. That's 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also send an email to openline at EWTN.com. A tremendous Thursday to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for taking a little time out of the back end of your week to join us here on Open Line Thursday. We talk the new evangelization on Thursdays with Father Larry Richards. And, you know, I'll give you a little insight. We'd probably slip in a little old evangelization if that's more more to your liking. But the number to be on the program is 1-800-585-9396. That's toll-free anywhere in North America, 1-800-585-9396. If you're outside the United States and Canada, your number is 1-205-271-2985. And we'll put you straight to the front of the line at one 205 271 Two nine eight five. You can send us an email, openline at EWTN.com, or you can text your question to Father Larry. Text the letters EWTN to 55000. Text your first name and your question. Message and data rates may apply. I'm Jack Williams. Michael McCall produces the program. Your call screeners, Mr. Matt Kubensky and Jeff Burson, handles our social media endeavors. And our host, as he is every single Thursday, live from... The shores of beautiful Lake Erie, Father Larry Richards. Father, how are you? I'm blessed, blessed, blessed today. Getting ready to do a weekend retreat here for our, we call it Divine Mercy Encounter. So we have about uh, 40 high school and college kids coming to encounter the mercy of Jesus this weekend. So always get real excited about that. Well, you know, Father, I just returned from wow. convocating with 3,500 of my closest friends in uh, Orlando, yeah. Florida, and our bishop put on a what is really just a spectacular event. Uh, we've, we've talked about it a little bit during the week, um, and I'm sure you've heard some feedback from some people that have that have attended. I really entered with, with very little expectation and was extremely pleasantly surprised by wow. the, the tone and tenor of the whole thing. And I was surprised uh, I wasn't invited. Nobody invited me. What's there? I have, I have, I have a new evangelization thing. What is this, Jack? You don't have any poll? You need to have a chat with your bishop there, my friend. Yeah, I know. He wasn't <laughs> there either. Trust me. That was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it was it was uh, the the message was challenging uh, and Good. loving. This you know, kind of the subtitle of the event was the mm-hmm. joy of the gospel in America, wow. and which is right up your alley. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, it, it and I, I kind of had a little bit of a, of an epiphany during Uh-oh. the uh, just like the Church of the Epiphany yes, in downtown I Pittsburgh. It. I get it. And uh, I had uh, a little bit of an epiphany that that you know sometimes we get bogged down in our own cynicism. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe we need to uh, stop taking a look so much at how implementable we think something is and maybe focus a little bit more on what role we can play in implementing something. Mm-hmm. Because Very I think good. our bishops did a great job at the convocation of leading the horses to the appropriate pool. Now, if the horses choose not to drink, that's not their fault. Yeah, exactly. You know, oh, they, take, they wow. take a lot of heat, and I think that it's uh, it's really a good thing. But it's really, uh, you know, I don't think we take enough personal responsibility for our baptismal mandate to spread the gospel. Absolutely. Think of every Catholic. Let's start thinking, this is my job, not the bishops or the priests alone. It's my job. Boy, the, the world would be converted in overnight. You know, it'd be like, whoa. Huh? Every Catholic start taking themselves seriously about the call of Jesus? Oh, my yeah, you know, and it's funny because in in the midst of these things, and you're so you're you're better acquainted with this phenomenon than probably anybody I know. But you go to a parish mission or a retreat or an event like this, you get all fired up, you're ready to roll, but that feeling is fleeting. It is. What is your advice to folks? who maybe listen on a Thursday to EWTN's open line, and they get excited, they're going to evangelize, they're turning over a new leaf, and then by Friday morning they're out of gas. Exactly, and I think because for too many people, feelings are everything. 
But really, feelings are nothing. You know? We make commitments to the Lord and we carry them through no matter how we feel. So I, that's why it's so important that, you know, when it comes to evangelization, it's not what we do. It's what the Spirit does within us. So if we make a commitment in our lives every day, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me and use me to bring others to Jesus. Now it's on the Spirit. And all i got to be is open and say that prayer. Everybody says something every day. So just to say a prayer of the Holy Spirit and ask him to use you to bring other people to Jesus is the most basic and wonderful thing you can do because you do that and then you do it whether you feel like it or you don't and then God can use you in a great and mighty way speaking of feeling like it or you don't uh, I know I know from firsthand experience that you generally travel in your clerics mm-hmm, um, which you know Even on of, vacation which makes you a bit of a target <laughs> yes <laughs> out in the public square how do you handle those situations when you've just been four days away from home at a parish mission and your flight got canceled and you got on a later flight and you're about ready to fall asleep and you sit down on the plane and someone wants to engage you in a conversation about um, maybe not even something that you would think remotely uh, involves the love of our Lord. How do you uh, muster the energy to not just say, I'm going to take a nap now? (laughs) Yeah, I, I love that when people do that. I always make sure like I have headphones and that and so I don't put them on. I always greet the person and because I'm almost every week, but 90% of people will not talk to me. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't, I don't force anything because I'm a big one about not forcing evangelization, but I'll ask how the day is, how's it going, da, 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 and that's it. And then I'll sit there and I'll kind of wait. And then if anything goes, okay, now I'll go to sleep. But if they sit there, because I always pray before I get on a plane, lose me today, Lord. But it's amazing how, and I don't know, like once it was a great thing, someone, I was, I was getting on a, I was on a plane and there was this kid coming in about 21 and she says he was asking where are you going where you're sitting and she where do I sit and she looked over there and she pointed next to me and he goes oh <laughs> and then he came and he says now father don't even start with me I'm an atheist and don't even start and I said that's why God set you next to me and so for the whole two hours we talked and at the end I says now you're not an atheist now are you and he goes I guess not. He was a questioner, and that's okay. I have no problems with questioners. And so it's great when it happens, and I get awful excited about it. But a lot of people, when they they see me, they go running. I don't know if it's me or what. So, Yeah. Wonderful. Well, we're talking the new evangelization here on an open line Thursday. The number is 1-800-585-9396. That's toll-free anywhere in North America, 1-800-585-9396. 585-9396 Open Line Thursday with Father Larry EWTN News Nightly with Lauren Ashburn. I met the Pope when he came to Washington, D.C., and from that moment on, I knew that I had to combine my faith with journalism, my job. I love coming to work because I know that I can talk about God on television and my pro-life views. And now, not only do I share it internally, but I share it with a global audience. How great is that? EWTN News Nightly with Lauren Ashburn. Weekdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. On Fire for EWTN, get Amazon Fire TV. All you need is a high-speed Internet connection, a TV, and the Amazon Fire TV player. Never miss any of your favorite EWTN television or radio programs again. Celebrating 100 years of Fatima with Monsignor Charles Pope. On October 13, 1917, Our Lady spoke to the children at Fatima, and she said, People must amend their lives and ask forgiveness for their sins if they want healings or conversion. And she says, Do not offend the Lord our God anymore, because He is already so much offended. Very often we want God to grant us many things, but the thing that God is most waiting for us to ask for is our own conversion. How pleased God is by this, and He will grant us every other thing besides if He can obtain our ongoing conversion. So Our Lady reminds us, Pray. Ask God for things, but always ask for the most important thing, our own conversion, and the conversion of people we know and love, indeed the whole world. This sort of prayer pleases the Lord. Join EWTN as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of Fatima. Visit EWTN.com slash Fatima. Hi, this is Barbara McWiggin. This is Bishop Robert Barron of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. 
This is Dr. Greg Popchak. And Lisa Popchak. Thanks for listening to EWTN Radio. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question or comment, call 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. We've got one line open at 1-800-585-9396. The race is on. 1-800-585-9396. To the phones we go. Our leadoff hitter today is James in Jefferson City, Missouri, listening to EWTN on Covenant Radio. James, what's your question today for Father Larry? Hello, James. I, yes, uh, I was a uh, uh, convert to Catholicism in 1970, raised uh-huh. with kids. Both of our kids, though, now are grown, don't have left the Catholic Church, mm. and have, and I said that at the time, let's say, well, I hope you go to a church, uh, at least some church that loves Jesus, and mm-hmm. now they're both Presbyterian, so wow. should, I just, should I just be happy that they're in a church, or should I worry I, about them? Well, would you worry I wouldn't them? worry, but I would pray, is what I would do, is just, uh, because in the, even in the press, what were you before you became Catholic? Uh, United Church of Christ. Oh, okay. You know, uh, so Presbyterians aren't that different in us in, in lots of ways, but in lots of ways they are. And often I sit there and I just want to explain to people when they come and talk to me, well, let's look at the basic difference. Uh, you know, you pray for them, you know, say the rosary for them and different things, but also like one of the basic differences between Catholics and uh, Protestants is Catholics believe that man is basically good. If given the choice between good and evil, man will always choose the good. Protestants, because of Luther, taught that man is basically evil because of the original sin. If given the choice between good and evil, man will always choose evil. With a real presence, uh, you know, we believe in real presence. Uh, Presbyterians believe more in a symbolic thing, but that could be changed depending on what uh, community you belong to. We believe in the Pope. We believe you need the Bible and, the, of course, the, uh, the Eucharist. And so those are things that I often say, Um, the best thing to do is pray for your kids but also if they ever want to talk about it well let's look at just the differences and engage them in a discussion like why because most people don't not go because of the the truth of the faith they go because of a community or because they married somebody who's presbyterian or they just don't want to follow the rules of the church and they think we have too many rules so there's a lot going on there so prayer can do the most thing but to also, another great thing to do is get them, you know, books like, oh, I read this book about Catholic for a reason or Rome Sweet Home, and I loved it. You might want to read it, too. Don't sit there and say, here, this will convert you. But I'll say, I read this. You might like it, too. And that could be a, uh, an instrument to help them also. Okay. Okie doke. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you, James. Thanks. Appreciate the phone call. That frees up a line for you at 1-800-585-9396. It's toll-free anywhere in the United States and Canada, 1-800-585-9396. Victor's watching on YouTube, Father Larry. Hi, Victor. How are you? Hi, Victor. He says, how hard it is to cope with the loss of a close loved one and what to do. How effective is prayer to ease the loneliness? Oh, I think it's the only thing that eases the loneliness. But one of the things we have to know as Catholics, and I say at every funeral I have, that we believe in the communion communion of saints. So often when I'm talking to people who just lost their husband or wife or mother or father, I say, you can be closer to them now than you ever were when they were on this earth. Because when they were on earth, you had to go see them, talk to them on the phone or different things. Now in the body of Christ, like communion isn't just communion with Jesus, it's communion with his whole body. And so if they are uh, in this, if they are in heaven now or in purgatory, you can still be quite intimate with them. So that's the first thing is know the spiritual reality. But the second thing is that we, that's why we have a church on earth. I often think how hard it must be for people who don't have a community around them to support them. You know, so like at our community, you know, we have uh, meals and that after for people who just lost at a funeral. But we also have people to check in on people when they come to Mass. We make sure they're taken care of, you know. And so it's that kind of stuff that we need to know the spiritual communion of saints that is around us and that we have intimacy with after someone's died. But boy, do we all need to count on each other. You know, and sometimes that's... uh, 
it's very hard, but if a good Catholic community, if we're not a community, like I've often told, I, uh, there's one thing I have in my door as you walk out since I've been here. I've been here 16 years. It says love one another because I say if people come to this church and they don't feel loved, we uh, uh, failed as Christians. Because Jesus said, all people know you're my disciples because you love one another. So especially when someone's lost somebody, you need your community around you to help uh, ease the pain and to know that you're never alone. Next up is Michael. He's in Sharonville, Ohio, listening to EWTN on Sacred Heart Radio. Michael, you're on with Father Larry. Hello, Michael. Hello, Father Larry. I was calling because... I was talking to my mom on my way to on our way to pick up my sister from St. Gertrude's choir camp, and I wow. asked her, "Why are there different rites about from the Catholic Church, like Roman Catholic, Byzantine, and Ethiopian?" Oh, there's even more than that. There's over twenty of them, but a lot of it is bec- part of the culture where they came from, you know. And there's ancient traditions in the church. So when, like uh, it used to be in the early church, almost everybody said mass differently, you know. And so, and so what happened was in Saint Ambrose, there's old thing tradition to him on. He's a part of the Roman rite, the Ambrosian rite, which is still in there. And then there's the Byzantine rites, and you know, a lot of them came from, you know, the 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 part of the Greek church and so when they were in union with us the the Holy Father and that let them keep their various rites and their traditions because some of these traditions are as old as the Roman tradition so that's why but it shows our unity isn't in how we say the mass our unity is in the person of Jesus in the Eucharist you know but there's ancient rites and there's a you know uh, uh, if you go to EWTN they have uh, Colin Donovan did a great thing about all the different rights, where they came from, and all that, and it'd be very helpful to you. All right. Well, thank all you, right. Father Larry. Thank you for calling. Okay. You be a priest, Have a nice Michael. Day. My, you my do. parents are huge fans. My mom's like, I'm sorry. Right now. There you yeah. go. Well, God bless right. you, Michael. You pray about the priesthood. Right. Bye, Father Larry. Bye, Michael. <laughs> 1-800-585-9396 is our toll-free number. Michael McCall, our producer, is considering being a priest right now. I can tell by the look in his eyes. Wow, eye. I'll that's bet. A, that's a bad thing, though, because he's married and expecting his first child here in I January. thought so. I was yeah, going to say, so how is that possible? We'll have to straighten him out after the program. <laughs> 1-800-585-9396 is our toll-free number. If you, you know someone named Jack is going to call next just because I've there said that There you now. go. one 800 585 Nine three nine six. That's the number Art used. He's in Mobile, Alabama, listening to EWTN on Archangel Radio. Art, thanks for holding. You're on with Father Larry. Hello, Art. Hello, Father Larry. How are you? I've got a question. Good, very well. Sure. What? What's up? There we go. There you go. What's up? <laughs> I got a question. Listening to your podcasts and on the open line and everything on EWTN's website, the event new evangelization that you have to love people before you can talk to them about mm-hmm. evangelization. And yeah. so I'm real comfortable <laughs> listening to that podcast. I feel great about things. I'm ready to go. Then you get into a conversation with friends or family, and it's such a secular bent. How mm-hmm. do you profess, how do you show them that love first when the conversation kind of agitates you <laughs> and then get to that evangelization? Oh, Art. Art, yes, art, art, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's the uh, that's exactly where it's coming to. Exactly there, like again, people love to push my buttons, you know. And so, if I'm in a conversation and they're pushing my buttons, usually uh, my love is a little stronger than normal, I would say. But I still think that you can love people even when they're pushing your buttons, right? You know, because uh, like again, when someone, it depends what they push the buttons on. Like if someone's talking to me about God, okay, I can goes all their questions or all their doubts and all that stuff and be sensible if someone comes and says i am pro-choice and i believe a woman can kill her child well then i get crazy you know because now you're going to sit there and because again i think it depends what people need think about how jesus dealt with people and that's what i always come back to Jesus, with the great sinners who knew they were sinners, was extremely compassionate, went out of his way. You know, neither do I condemn you, that, that, that. But Pharisees who would take him on, he would go right at them. 
and he would, in love, challenge them, tell them they're going to hell if they don't change the deepest, darkest, you know, their their whitened sepulchers. I mean, these are things that he, who is love, still challenged them way because that's what they needed. So I think in our own life, everybody, you know, some people think, oh, we have to be gentle with everybody. Jesus was not gentle with everybody in any way, shape, or form. So when I say that we love them, that means we're praying for them, we're loving them, we're showing them that we're loving them, but that doesn't mean we're pushovers and we just, oh, I just think you're special. Uh Uh-uh. Sometimes you need a kick in the butt because what you're thinking is wrong, you know? So yeah, that's why it's so important. You're praying to the Holy Spirit every day and you're asking him to uh, use you and then you get out of the way and let him do things through you but again it's not an easy reality every time does that help deep breath count to three <laughs> i didn't say that but that works too. <laughs> there you go much. all right whatever god calls you to thank you for calling us all right bye-bye god bless you art that opens up the line for you at 1-800-585-9396 it's toll free anywhere in north america 1-800-585-9396 Nine three nine six. You can also send us an email, open line at EWTN.com. You can text your question to Father Larry. He's a 21st century kind of guy. Just mm-hmm. text, the, uh, text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for a response. Text your first name and your question. Message and data rates may apply. We've got an email from Sean, Father. He says, Aloha, Father Larry. Nice. Say, hey, I want to come to Hawaii. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you need an invite. I know, exactly. <laughs> Go ahead. They pay in pineapple, you know. Yeah, it's okay. okay. <laughs> I t- I, look, I, if they paid in pineapple, I'd take the gig. I, yeah, exactly. I, I, love, I love pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> I take communion every week to an assisted living home for about 8 to 10 people. Last week there was a Protestant that joined the group and received communion during our session. I didn't know that she wasn't Catholic until I was notified the following week. How do I handle this situation without insulting this person but staying rooted in our Catholic beliefs and maybe evangelizing her as well? That's Sean in Hawaii, I'm assuming. In Hawaii, there you go. And Well, again, my biggest thing is that you know, it wasn't harmful. The, the biggest thing is they need to have the faith of the real presence of the Eucharist. And so often, like especially in nursing homes and different things, you know, half the time you don't know, you know, but I always sit there, if I don't know the person, I'll just sit there and say, do you believe that this is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ? And if they can say yes, okay. But if you know specifically someone's Protestant, well, the church teaching, they can't receive communion. So you want to talk to them in a in a gentle way about, you know, do you have the same faith as we do? You know, uh, you know do you believe that it's gone the first part but the second is communion shows that we have union with each other and the sad thing is we don't have union yet the way we need to have union you know again i've often talked about it in the way that it's kind of like having intimacy sexual intimacy before marriage the very intimate act is a lie because there is no true intimacy before god yet with the uh, the union and being blessed by God. The two have not become one spiritually, so when they become one physically, it's a lie because that should be carrying out physically. The same with the union of the churches, that when we are now one spiritually, and this is what we believe, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, then we can receive one communion the way we need to. Got an email also here from Vincent, and he says, Father Larry, I serve in in a parish, especially helping out during Mass, like taking announcements and readings, but I recently requested our parish priest to allow me to volunteer with the Sunday school children because I feel I can contribute towards these kids growing up being good Catholics, which he welcomed. So I'm asking, what are the basics to teach kids the faith, and how can I contribute with that, which is in line with uh, the church um for kids that are between the ages of five and twelve again i think the greatest thing we can do with anything is be a witness to them and so to invite the kids to know jesus and the best way to do that is to pray with kids to talk about how god loves them uh especially because 
again, as I've said before, that before God gave the Ten Commandments, he still, he first set his people free from their slavery in Egypt. And that's, that's got to be the way we teach our children. We don't just teach them the commandments, because the commandments came after being set free. We teach them about the love of Jesus, and then when they go, you know, uh, when they come to know they're loved and say, do you want to love Jesus? Yes. Well, here's what his commandments are, and these are the commandments of God, and these are the way you prove that you love Jesus. But we sit there and we talk about the love of Jesus first. And so the man should witness, first of all, about how he's experienced God's love. And I think the best thing we can teach children is how to pray. And so we talk about prayers, absolutely, and they should memorize prayers and do that stuff, especially age appropriate. But they need to know that that's only part of their prayer. The biggest part of prayer, even for a child, is to learn to listen. So if they're taught from the very beginning that this is always a conversation between you and God, so you need to say your prayer, but then you need to say, God, you speak to me. What do you want from me? And that'll at least get them on the road to start having an experience of Jesus. Because you can go through a lot of prayers and never have an experience of God. So that's what I think is greatest importance. One line open at 1-800-585-9396. It's toll-free anywhere in North America, 1-800-585-9396. Open line, Thursday with Father Larry. Father Robert Spitzer. First of all, you will get a much deeper awareness of your faith, much deeper awareness of the evidence for your faith, explanations of tough theological issues, how science and reason and faith come together, and above all, a deeper awareness of how to practice your faith and how to live it. Father Spitzer's Universe with Father Robert Spitzer. Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Living the Beatitudes with Father Bjorn. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you're on a football team, you don't want to just run up and down the field holding the ball and never cross into the end zone and get a touchdown. If you're on vacation, you don't want to drive all the way to Orlando and then never enter into the magic kingdom. We want to reach our goal, but there are a lot of obstacles, discouragement, and challenges along the way. Jesus' voice is the one calling us to say yes to him, to live the life that he's calling us to live. We have to choose one way or the other, choose him or not. But if we choose him, we will be opposed. We're going to have people challenge what we believe or call us crazy. But Jesus doesn't just say, come follow me, to follow a beatitude. He's calling us to be like himself. He is the beatitudes. He doesn't just say, do what I say. He says, come follow me. He's with us every step of the way, transforming our weakness into strength. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. EWTN. Live truth. Live Catholic. We need EWTN Radio for the reason that Mother Angelica founded this entire enterprise. She always saw this as a spiritual growth network. It was to be an enterprise in media that reached people in all aspects of their life. She saw this as a a holistic approach to reaching the whole person in the middle of the world and bringing them truth and life. Raymond Arroyo thinks Catholic Radio is important. So should you. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question or comment, call 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. That's right, openline at EWTN.com and put something in the subject line like Thursday or Father Larry or the new evangelization. If you've got a question about how you can start evangelizing or about how you can improve your evangelization or if you have maybe even uh, an edifying story about your experience with evangelization and the new evangelization using maybe social media that you'd like to share with us, we'd love to hear that. Send us an email, openline at EWTN.com. Back to the phones we go. Lucy is in Dallas, Texas. She's listening to EWTN on Guadalupe Radio. Lucy, you're on with Father Larry. Hello, Lucy. Hi, good afternoon, Father Larry. I am calling to find out your opinion of how to handle um, misconceptions of Christian unity. Mm -hmm. I was kind of edified to hear, um, I was 
flipping radio stations, and it was a, a station that had just changed formats, and um, it, it sounded like they were, they were talking about, you know, um, the churches um, becoming, Christian churches talking about getting together, more, you know, having more things in common and actually getting together, unifying all Christian churches. I'm thinking, hey, this is great. Mm-hmm. And as it turned out, the station was probably more of a Lutheran or some other type of Protestant sure. station. I think it was Lutheran. Mm-hmm. And I heard a few things that were, you know, kind of like, hmm, that's, it, that they had kind of some issues with the Catholic Church. And sure. I wanted to get your opinion of, because I, I wanted to call in and say, well, that's wrong, but I, I didn't know how to address it. So I wanted to call and ask you, Father Larry, how do we, he- how do we handle misconceptions, common misconceptions about the Catholic Church to our Protestant brethren? I think that that's where truth comes, that we speak truth no matter what. You know, I have met with, uh, for many years, with a group of Protestant ministers. And uh, we once all went and retreat once. And, you know, they sat there and one of the guys asked me, he says, Larry, we know you love Jesus. Well, thank you. But what are you going to do with Mary? You know, like Mary's a big stumbling block. And I said, oh, I'm glad you asked. Here. And I told him about Mary. And then every minister there says, I could believe that. Well, of course she could believe that. And so I often think that the, what we need most is have a, you know, again, we need to listen on both sides. Again, we want everyone to listen to us, right? Now, you listen to me. Now, shut up. I really don't care about what you have to say, but here's the truth. And they think the same thing about us, you know. No, you listen to me. I don't care what you have to say. I'm only concerned about the truth. And I think we have to come and have true dialogue about, okay, Tell me why you believe what you believe. Now, I want to tell you why we believe what we believe. And usually, it's together. We can really agree on most things. It's amazing. You know, especially when we can all talk about, all Christians can talk about, we are saved by grace. That is an um, unbelievable, powerful thing about we're saved by grace. Now, how we're saved by grace is where we have the differences. We believe you need faith and works. They believe faith and loan. But we all believe that we're saved by grace. So you build on what we agree on first, and then you start having dialogue about those other things so we all can come to truth. Can and the I truth... Ask, can sure. I ask you one specific question? Sure. Okay, this, this is... To me, it seems so uh, clear. And mm-hmm. how do they? How do they not believe that the that the Eucharist that you know that, that what we have as the sacrifice of the Mass becomes the, the body and blood of, blood of Christ? And you know, because in the Bible, you know, after the loaves and fishes, Jesus said, and of course, all those people kind of got upset, and a lot of people left. Sure, where he said, "You have to eat my uh, flesh and drink my sure. blood." To, to you know to be to come to heaven sure and they've always uh, interpret I always interpret that later on see because again Luther was a priest and so when he left and then you know a lot of them stayed you know he married a nun and everything else but as time went on in the church in those days they only received communion four times a year that was a Catholic tradition you know a daily mass uh, going to receive communion every day wasn't until much later and so the Protestants adopted this four times a year thing but then they knew as we we knew you needed a validly ordained priest to bring forth the Blessed Sacrament. So when they no longer had validly ordained priests, then they said, well, the Blessed Sacrament isn't that important. What Jesus was really talking about is his teaching. You know, now John 6, there's a lot against that, absolutely positively. But that's the way they learned to interpret that to uh, okay how they had been living. You know, because now they don't, they can't receive the Eucharist and that. So, and then they would take the words of Jesus and say, you know, do this in memory of me. So it's a memorial. It's not the same thing. We don't re-kill Jesus. So again, and that's the way it was interpreted later on. But it was interpreted that way just to okay the practice they were always already practicing. Yeah, even though even though Jesus said at that even last though, supper, this is my body. Absolutely, God. sure. And to me, to me, it's clear that he reconfirmed well, of what course. he said earlier. And but it got, it to, and to the Baptist, it's clear that's not what he meant. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. 
And that's the point. And you can sit there and say, are you stupid? Why don't you believe that? But that ain't going to help matters no. now, is it? That's no. what I'm saying. So our, our job is to enter into dialogue, and then they'll go back to the Greek. And what I always go back to is, well, what did the early church fathers say? And that's where why we believe tradition. Because let's say six of us come together, and one's a uh, Protestant uh, Baptist, one's an Episcopalian, one's a Roman Catholic, and we all gonna and we're all going to pray, and one's a non-denominational. Let's all pray about this one verse. This is my body. Do this in memory of me. And we pray, and we fast, and we pray, and we fast, and after a week of praying and fasting, we come together and say, okay, what did God tell you? And then one person says, well, I believe it's a symbol. God told me that. Another person says, well, I believe it's the real presence of God, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Another person says, what well, is the real presence, but only as long as the people are there. Afterwards, it doesn't belong to real presence, as the Lutherans believe. And, that's what I, and then we're going to say, well, who's right? We all prayed. We all went, used the Word of God as our uh, authority, but we all came to six different conclusions. So who's right? Well, we go to the church fathers. What did St. Augustine and St. Ambrose and uh, Justin Martyr, what did they say? They knew the apostles. And then we have all this teaching there about it was the, truly the body and blood and soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. Oh, so that's why we need it. But you, get, you have to work to get there, you know, because they're going to just say, well, the word of God says this and this. Okay, well, I say something different. So now let's sit there and go through the history and why we believe what we believe. You know, it's at least start the dialogue is what I always do. Okay. Okie doke. Thank you, Father Larry. Thank you. God bless you. 1-800-585-9396 is our toll-free number, 1-800-585-9396. That's the number Chris used in Youngstown, Ohio, listening to EWTN Radio. Chris, thanks for holding. You're on with Father Larry. Hello, Chris. Hi, Father Larry. How are you? I'm blessed. You're not too far away from me in Youngstown. No, not at all, because you're in Pittsburgh area, right? I'm in Erie, so. But I'm from okay. Pittsburgh, but it's a little bit farther, but I'm still, I've been in Youngstown many times. What's up? Okay, so um, I went through RCA um, classes for the last uh -huh. year, and okay. in Easter, everybody got confirmed. Okay. And I, out of two women, were out of the eight of class of eight, were unable to confirm because here uh, my husband only had a divorce of decree and not an annulment with his ex wife. Sure, so sure. So now I have, so I have to wait till like November. So now seeing everybody, but like during Eucharist and, um, you know, during the whole the mass and everything, when sure. everybody's taking Holy Communion, it's kind of rough on me because I have to let everybody out of my pew, then get yes. back down to my knees and pray. And, and it's like, I, I don't, I'm not jealous, but I'm kind of like, oh my gosh, I wish I was up there taking sure. the Holy Communion and the Eucharist and being one with sure. you know, Christ and Father God. And so sure. I, I've done the prayer with Stay With Me from Father, oh, it begins with the P, but I just, is there any, not a board of a curse, but with prayers or thoughts that you can give me during sure. the Eucharist as I'm kneeling to get my mind on what I'm supposed to instead of, Absolutely. you know, watching and doing There is, there is a, a bunch of prayers if you go on Google for spiritual communion. And it has a spiritual communion that there's a couple very nice prayers there for that. But you also got to know that Christ still lives inside of you because you've been baptized, correct? Yes. Yeah, so he does live inside of you. We bring the real presence because that's what he taught us. And But again, we bring the real presence to the real presence that Christ is in you. He doesn't leave you, you know. And so the problem is, is that, you know, like when your husband was uh, you know, married before and didn't get an annulled, that has to happen. But that should be able to happen pretty fast. In our diocese, okay. it's less than three months, you know. So as long as, as soon as they get all the uh, paperwork in, it's very fast. And now there's no longer a need for a second instance which means it doesn't have to go to another diocese to be okayed you know that diocese oh, okay. can do it itself and then you could come back and you have your marriage blessed and it can be a very simple thing so you might be able to, if, if, if all this paperwork's in it could happen much faster than november well that's good to hear well they already blessed our marriage and we read it in catholic he thought that we did have an annulment and when the monsignor comes to when he looked at the paperwork he's like oh this is actually not a, um, an annulment yeah. it's a decree <laughs> Yeah, so, so you can't enter, you, but you can't enter into a valid marriage until that's annulled. 
I have to still get uh, re-blessed again then? Yes, because you can't be okay. in a, you're not in a valid marriage. And again, a lot of this, you know, especially when you're new coming in, it seems like, what the heck? But when you look yeah. at it from the whole perspective about, okay, this is what Jesus taught. How do we deal with this? And so, but this is what the Catholic faith belongs and says. So once right. you come in, okay, this is why we believe it. And there's a lot, a lot of reasons. Like some often, often people will say to me, Father, we got to get this, you know, get rid of this and get up to the times about no, this divorce and remarriage. I says, if we do, then we're no longer followers of Jesus because it's Jesus who taught us we can't divorce and remarry. That's from the very mouth right. of Jesus Christ. So when it happens, well, how do we deal with this? So it shouldn't right. be easy in a lot of ways. It should be a little bit harder. But while you're doing this, don't Jesus knows you and he loves you and he knows your desire for him. So use that and say, Jesus, I, I take this. I'm so hurt because that's what you are. You're hurt that you right. can't receive I, him. I, I haven't even went to mass in three weeks, and that's not me. I'm like, I have to get back. You know what? You know, Chris, I was getting frustrated. Let me, let me tell you a little story, Chris, because I found okay. myself in a very similar situation to yours many years ago. And when I went through the RCIA program, the annulment process was a little more involved than it is today. Or I shouldn't say it's a little. It wasn't. It wasn't well, sure, it no, took longer. Yeah, yeah. It, it took longer. It wasn't yeah, yeah. any less involved than it did. Yes, yes. So when Easter Vigil came, uh, I was in your situation, uh, an annulment had not been granted. So what eventually happened is that annulment was granted in late November of that year, so several months after the Easter Vigil. And what actually right, happened was, is November, yeah, yeah, my wife and I were actually able to have our marriage convalidated, and we did it in a mass that was held at the beginning of of RCIA class that night for the next class that had started in the fall of that mm. year. And there were three people in the annulment process that were in that class that were so blessed by seeing where they were heading that wouldn't have had that witness had everything gone the way that I thought it should have gone and I would have right. been ready at Easter Vigil. So you really don't know you know, what our Lord might have in store for you in your situation. Right. Wow. So, but that's the thing. But again, and that's a great thing in Texas. But it, my mom too had to go through the same type of stuff. And so, there's lots of people in your situation. But Jesus knows your heart and say, Jesus, I offer this up. And it could be in reparation for your sins. It could be. I always say, do it for somebody else who you know suffering. So as you're sitting there, if there's someone you know it has cancer, or someone doesn't know Jesus, say, Jesus, I take this pain and I offer it up for them. And then you can oh, okay. really be transformative of that. Okay. All right, thank you so much. And just one last thing. I was sure. going to read your book, Surrender. I absolutely uh -huh. love it. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. Thank you for saying that. Keep reading it. Do all the stuff you need to do. Okay, God bless you. Right. Thanks a lot. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Awesome, thanks. And I'll tell you what else Chris can do and what everybody else can do, Father Larry, is they can head over to Church Pop. Churchpop.com. Uh, it's the newest member of the EWTN family. It's got new Christian content that's fun and inspiring every day. The videos, the uh, the little infographics, the articles, everything is just spectacular on Church Pop. If you haven't been there yet, I, uh, I, I'm going to mandate that you go there. Whoa. Otherwise, you're going to have to go to confession with Father Larry. Oh, he can't do that, but All that's right. okay. <laughs> I'll, back, I'll back off of that then. But if you're so inclined, is that better? You there can you find go. it on Snapchat, Instagram, and on the web at churchpop.com. Back to the phones we go. Back Anna to the is, phones. Anna is in Southern California listening to EWTN Radio. Anna, you're on with Father Larry. Hello. Father Larry. Hi. Our... Thank you for taking my call. Absolutely. What's up? <laughs> my question is, how do I go about explaining to someone that does not uh, want to understand or is questioning the reason for the gift of tongues. Mm -hmm. uh, this person only thinks that it was possible on the Pentecost day because of the different people gather speaking different languages. Sure. Now that's not scriptural for them to say that because Paul talks about speaking in tongues. He forbids the community to do it when there's non-believers there because people sit there and think there's three different kinds of tongues traditionally. The first tongue is the tongue you're talking about, which is uh, the, the it's the tongue of evangelization, which means that uh, the apostles uh, said one thing and everybody heard it in their own tongue. 
first type of tongues. The second type of tongues is the tongue of praise. And that's a tongue where in a charismatic community in that, and they praise God in tongues. And, you know, it's uh, because we do not know how to pray as we ought, so the Spirit himself prays within us. In the Greek, it's called a seer. Go, 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 go. I don't say it right. Other people will tell you. And then the third tongue is a tongue of prophecy, which means in a prayer group that one person speaks a tongue and someone interprets it. And that's all in Corinthians, you know, so you don't just dismiss that and say, and that's what people did for years. Well, that was just in the old, uh, the New Testament church. It wasn't later. I've experienced it. I speak in tongues and there's a lot of reality for that. I mean, you don't have to agree with it. You know, it's the least of all the gifts. So I always tell people it's very scriptural. You can't go off of that, but you can also, there's a lot on Google and uh, Catholic uh, dot uh, com and all those places that can also explain the tongue a phenomenon but it's 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 not necessary for a christian but it is a gift of the holy spirit it's one of the charismatic gifts i see i understand thank you for giving me thank more you too. there you go <laughs> god bless you <laughs> thank you have a good bye day bye bye Still plenty of time for your phone calls at 1-800-585-9396. Next stop, Overland Park, Kansas. Ken is in Overland Park listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Ken, you're on with Father Larry. Hello, Ken. Father, it's always good speaking with you. Nice talking to you. What's up? Um, I, I guess I've got a, a kind of a two-part question here. Okay. Um, first question would be, how do I keep myself involved with uh, not wanting to leave the church? Okay. Uh, when I see another man that is, uh, uh, who was uh, kind of a model for me, why I joined, I've seen him leave and no. you know why he left and he's, he's now, yeah, he's now going to church of the, he's going to core, uh, which is a local church out here. And, okay. um, and it's, a uh, and he was a devout man. Everybody in the entire community knew this man. And this mm-hmm. just recently happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was one of the reasons I joined and got involved with the, with the Knights, became a third degree, got my family involved more, mm-hmm. uh, kids are involved um, in the church and doing more things, being active in the church, a fourth degree, honor guard, just sure. just doing as much as I can. He did the same thing, and him and I are both, uh, he was involved more than I can even explain to you. I mean, he did other things that only most of the people there. Uh, Have you asked him why he left? Would know. I'm sorry? Have you asked him uh, why he left? He he, uh, he left because he was directly affected by um, uh, the the, uh, the leadership. Okay, leadership. Uh-huh. And and it and it and he was cut very deep. Now, uh, if you met this man, you'd know where he went to church. He would tell you. He would sure. tell you what he do, uh, what he did, and what he was involved with. And he was a sure. type of man that never wanted accolades for anything. He just sure, he sure. just spoke with who he was and why he was involved. So. He's gone, and sure. and he's, he's no interest in wanting coming back. And I, you know, I get other men to try to reach out to him, as I've been told to do, and and that's and and I've done pretty well. But you know, sure. the, the parts well, first I struggle of all, with are, you know, he's hurt. Absolutely, and how can I help him that's do, exactly. How can I help him get over that. Yeah, and then I find myself picking sides with him. Sure, of course, and that's and the point. And it's, and it's hard. Of course, it's hard. But let me tell you, no one will hurt you more than the Church of Jesus Christ. I promise you that. <laughs> you ask, uh, and you ask Padre Pio, all the saints. I mean, I have been crucified, died, and buried by the Church again and again. But that's where resurrection comes. And I think that the point of that is because it's the same. The only people that can really hurt you is the people you love right? And again, your spouse might hurt you. They don't do it on purpose, but it's still, you get hurt by your spouse all the time, and you think, why does this happen? And the, the, the biggest thing is to, we stay focused on not the feeling of being hurt, but okay, what's true? I've, I've said a thousand times, I would have left the Catholic Church years ago if it wasn't for the truth that it teaches. Because there's people, me included, who do not live the way we need to live all the time. And so mm-hmm. if I just move because, you know, I was hurt, boy, I'd have left a long time ago. But it's truth. I can't go against truth. This is the truth. And truth is what we do what we do for. And that's the biggest thing. You know, Father, that, that being said, you know, I remembered what, uh, what, what Deacon Jones, Alex Jones, had said when God he was here him. and he spoke at uh-huh. his conference. He said, once he saw the truth, how could he deny? I have to tell you, I I ask myself that same question to myself, and I've I've been been struggling with posing it to to my friend and and saying to him, you know, listen to what Deacon said. 
once you've seen the truth, how can you deny? Well, you because he's been hurt. Else that, that's sure. Happened. I, I would encourage that. him about the Eucharist is the biggest thing because he received Eucharist all the time, and now he's turned his back on the Eucharist, and that would be that's exactly that's exactly yeah. what I said, Father, to myself. I sure. have not brought that up yet. Sure, and again, you do right. sh- you shouldn't do it in a way that's condemning, but say, you know, well, I couldn't, you know, I I, I agree with you on so many things, but I just couldn't leave Jesus in the Eucharist, and that's all yep. you have to do. You don't have to say, you know, why did you? You just say, I agree with you, boy. You were hurt, and boy, I can agree with that hurting, but I just couldn't leave the Eucharist, no matter how bad I got hurt, and that's the end so of Father, it. Father, I had the same. I had the same. Say, uh, probably about eight years ago, same thing happened to me. Same mm-hmm. location. Sure. And I could turn. Did I want to leave? Absolutely. Yes, sir. I sure. Did. I was I was about out the door, and I struggled with a fog for a week. A sure. week. I felt like the entire world was gray. I turned sure. around, and I remember that Friday night. I said, "I cannot leave. That is yep. not who I am. Yep. That's not who He created me to be. I'm not. Yep. I, what you said." He made us to be strong, loving, and wise. Sure. I'm not about to run. Sure. So, again, that's what you got to do is stay focused on that reality. And, uh, again, we don't let our feelings dictate the truth. We just follow truth. So, But it's, it's not <sighs> right, easy. Father. Okay? Well, All you right, pray thanks, for him, too. God bless you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. We've got an email from Peter in Kentucky. He says, I have a friend who is starting to become more and more interested in Eastern Orthodoxy. Mm-hmm. I'm happy that my friend is investigating ancient Christianity, and I'm glad she's discovering liturgy and the sacraments. However, as a Catholic, I would love for her to consider the fullness of truth in the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. How can I better introduce her to Catholicism when much of what she's attracted to in Orthodoxy is not found in the local Catholic Church? She loves to visit the small Orthodox community here. What issues should I bring up? I don't want her to think I'm merely trying trying to, quote-unquote, win her over. Well, and again, a lot of people are attracted to the orthodoxy of uh, the liturgy and that, but you can find that, if you like that stuff, in the Byzantine, uh, the rites here. You know, one of my kids, um, well, was, I was a spiritual director for years, both him and his wife, really, they, they are now Byzantine Catholics, and they're under Rome and everything else, but they just love the uh, Eastern Rite liturgy. And, uh, you know, they love the incense and the and the bells and the mass that goes on. And they just think it's the greatest thing ever. And you can do that and do that in the Catholic Church. You don't need to leave the Catholic Church and find that. You know, Byzantines are just as much Catholic as Romans. You know, sometimes we always think, well, we're all Roman. No, we're not. There's many different... Many different um, rights in the church and so i'd encourage her to find that because there got to be a byzantine right there that she could have the same type liturgy and stay in the catholic church we're heading to north carolina next southeastern north carolina is where richard's listening to ewtn radio richard you're on with father larry hello hello, richard what's up uh how can i keep people who were in the catholics coming home program or the leaders and Mm -hmm. people come to us with marriages that are, are uh, not annulled. Yet sure. They want to keep participating, and we tell them, hey, your first stop needs to be the parish priest. You need to go see him and work this thing out. But they uh, kind of tell us, no, we're going to stick right here. And then uh, sometimes sure. the religious inspector says, hey, that's into their conscience and you can't get there. How do we help them? Well, and again, I think the first thing we do is pray for them and we love them. You know, oh, we want to, I can, because sometimes when we just send them off to a priest, then it's like we're putting them off and say, I want to walk with you. You know, I want to, let's go see the priest together, you know, or let's ask Father, let's invite Father here next week. And, you know, people, if they know that you're walking with them through a process, they'll do anything. If they feel that, you know, you just have to go through some hoops to come into the church, then they don't want to be bothered so often. And I don't blame them you know we need to walk with people and so you can do that in your catholics coming home thing and saying okay you have a problem we're going to help you with that problem and that's what we do with uh, hopefully everybody you know too often we're for people like okay you have to get this this and this fixed first then you can come to jesus no 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 you come to jesus and then we're going to help you fix all this stuff that's what we got to make sure the way we're evangelizing we bring them to jesus and then we work with their stuff because we all got stuff, let me tell you. <laughs> so, Thanks so much for the phone call, Richard. We appreciate it. Father Larry, thank you for being so gracious as you always are with your time. 
Oh, sure. Would you leave us with a blessing? Absolutely. Holy Father, great God of love and mercy, we ask you to bless everyone who's hearing us now. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. On behalf of our host, Father Larry Richards, producer Michael McCall, our call screener Matt Kubensky, social media manager Mr. Jeff Burson, I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line Thursday. Back at it tomorrow. Our very own Vice President of Theology, Mr. Colin Donovan, is in the house taking your questions on theology. Give Colin a call tomorrow on Open Line. Back at it Monday with John Martinoni. Until we get together then, God bless.